Okay, we're going to get started. So uh, next up will be the um, panel on the Silicon Valley Innovation Program. And the moderator for that is going to be Dr. Douglas Mon, who is the division director over at CSD within HSARPA as part of Science and Technology Group. And um, his research interests are related to programs in the area of networking and information assurance. And Dr. Mon has been responsible for helping market over 40 commercial and open source information security products uh, during the past 12 years at DHS and is, in fact, the senior executive responsible for the Silicon Valley Innovation Program. Uh, prior to his appointment at DHS, he has had, uh, he's done work at DARPA, and he's also done work at NSA. And again, I, I must commend him on the work that he's done with these folks to really start to bring a lot of these products to commercialization, and uh, he's going to talk a lot about that. So uh, welcome, Dr. Doug Mon. Thanks, Bob. Welcome. Uh, what we'll do over the next uh, 45 minutes is uh, give you some idea of what the Silicon Valley Innovation Program is at DHS Science and Technology. And uh, we have four of the startups on stage, and we're going to hear it from them. Um, so you don't have to know whether the government's telling the truth or not. You'll have to just take it from the words of the four companies. Um, with us today, we have uh, uh, Bob Baxley from Bastille. Jeff Finan from Equidine at the end of the table, Mike Gormley from Tamer, and uh, Josh Wells from Plank Aero Systems. And they'll give you a little bit more detail. I wanted to just give you a flavor of what SVIP is. For those of you not uh, familiar with Silicon Valley Innovation Program, obviously the name is, um, it's not just in Silicon Valley, right? It's symbolic. This was how do we engage the innovation sector and the, the startups from a DHS perspective. The history is in April of 2015, the secretary of DHS was uh, speaking at RSA and made the comment that DHS would have a Silicon Valley innovation or a Silicon Valley office. Um, and that was in April of 2015. Uh, that was handed to S&T and uh, within uh, eight months, we started our first uh, call in December of, of 2015 and uh, have been going strong ever since. So we are actually a startup ourselves if you really want to look at that, we're, you know, 20 months old. So what are we trying to do? Um, what is DHS trying to do from a Silicon Valley perspective in the program? The, the goal is to reach out to startups and, and young companies to bring their technology into an operational environment as quickly as possible. This is not a place where the, the department had played previously. And uh, so it's, it's been a learning experience for us as well. But what are we really trying to do? So the first thing is education. Startups don't uh, necessarily think of the government as a, uh, a market or a customer to start with. So we're, we're spending a lot of time educating the startup community and the investors and VCs about what DHS's mission space is. Second then is actually the funding. So we are funding companies. The value proposition for a startup is up to 800,000 and up to 24 months. Those are the ceilings. If they can do it faster, and several of these companies are, um, and they can do it cheaper, that's fine too. The, uh, the third thing then is to take their technology and get it into an operational environment as quickly as possible with our customer set. And so we're giving them opportunities to evaluate their technology with operational customers, and they'll give you a flavor of how that's working out as well. We've been um, successful in leveraging over uh, $400 million to date of other investments that have been made with the companies that we have funded um, as well. How does the program work? So if you're a startup, uh, you fill out an application. It's a 10-page application. Uh, you know, most companies can do a 10-page uh, application. We evaluate those applications on a monthly basis. The, if we like your application, we will invite you in for either an in-person or a WebEx pitch. Uh, like the Valley, you get 15 minutes. Uh, we get 15 minutes to ask you questions. And at the end of that time period, we'll make a decision that day whether we're going to fund you or not. So what we've done is taken what was a traditional three to four month process of proposal evaluation down to 30 minutes. That's one of our innovations. The second innovation is using 
the other transaction authority. We are doing contracting in an average of 30 to 45 days. Our fastest has been 10 days, um, and that's a pretty good average right now is 30 to 45. Um, I'm hoping we'll get it faster, but this has been a great partnership between the Science and Technology Directorate, our Office of Procurement Operations, and our Office of General Counsel. Um, again, another innovation is the, the streamlined other transaction authority. What are we funding? So, so far we've had nine calls, and uh, we, we have uh, five of them have closed. We have four active and a couple more that are going to be coming out shortly. Uh, you'll hear from the, the companies um, what call they're working on and what technology they're bringing to the table. Um, we have to date uh, received over 220 applications. We have invited over 40 pitches, and we just funded our 22nd company um, just last, last week, the week before. So about a 10% uh, acceptance rate for uh, so far of the, of the companies. Um, and even though it is, uh, a, we're in the U.S., we can accept international applications. So far we've had, uh, we've had 10 international applications as well. Uh, one of the companies that is funded is a U.S. company, but their research arm is in Tel Aviv. So we can also uh, fund those things outside the, the, the uh, traditional. Again, our focus is non-traditional performers using the other transaction uh, mechanism. With that, as a quick introduction, let me um, uh, introduce our, our panelists, let them give you a, a, a short introduction of their company, uh, what technology they're bringing to the table, and then we'll go ahead and ask them some questions, and, uh, and then we'll um, let uh, you, the audience, uh, have at it. So let me start first with uh, next to me is Josh Wells. Josh is with a company called uh, uh, Plank Aerosystems. So Josh, why don't you take a couple minutes and tell them what Plank's all about. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Josh Wells. I started Plank Aerosystems a little over three years ago in sort of true startup fashion uh, in my garage with one of my friends. We, uh, we started out trying to solve the problem of how do we use small UAS from small boats at sea. My background, I was a naval aviator, and uh, coming out of that world, I understood the value prop of having an airborne surveillance asset uh, at sea. But the real gap that I saw was we can't use uh, airborne surveillance from small boats. And if you look at the number of, of vessels at sea, there's a significant number more uh, in the less than 30 foot range than that uh, that can support uh, full manned aircraft. So, uh, that was sort of the original business thesis, was that we would build the technology to do, to enable that operation. Uh, that proved to be a, a very difficult technical problem. So we spent the last almost three years uh, solving that particular problem, and, uh, and that technology is, is now mature and, and deployed uh, commercially. We actually pitched that, uh, a maritime solution, to DHS originally, um, and, uh, and through sort of, you know, feedback, and uh, an iteration, we got to the point where we said, you know, this is the same technology is uh, is applicable to a truck-based solution. And so, uh, as of uh, March of this year, we've been under contract with uh, with DHS S and T to build a uh, a truck-based small UAS solution for uh, Border Patrol. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we're working under the small UAS solicitation, uh, and we're working closely with uh, CBP and uh, the sector San Diego. We actually have uh, a vehicle on loaner from uh, from CBP sector San Diego, and we go out with the uh, with the border patrol agents um, and test and operate sort of in the real live operational environment uh, at least uh, once a week. Great, thanks, Josh. Exciting. Um, next will be uh, Bob uh, <coughs> Baxley. Next to him, next to him from Bastille. Bob. Hi there, everyone. I'm Bob Baxley. I'm the chief engineer at Bastille. Um, so Bastille is an IoT security platform, um, and our, our first customers are enterprise customers. Let me tell you a little bit about you know, how we came on the problem that we're solving. Um, we thought at Bastille, we looked around, and we said, well, IoT is exploding. There's all these devices that are IoT that are coming into the enterprise, and our enterprise IT security people have no way of knowing that the, these devices exist or what vulnerabilities are associated with them. And so we looked around, what, how do enterprise security people secure their environment from non-IoT devices? Well, they use a combination of network security and agent-based security. So agent-based security is antivirus on a computer or a mobile device manager on a phone, these sorts of things. Network security is something in your switch, intrusion protection system, intrusion pr 
prevention system, um, network access control, data loss prevention. There's all these, all these buzzwords that, that vendors sell to help enterprises secure their, their wired network. And what we realized is there was no analogous set of products for IoT. And so if we look at that real quick, the agent-based security system doesn't work for IoT devices because IoT devices are power constrained, they're swap constrained. They can't run an agent. Um, there's no antivirus for, for, for IoT devices. Now there's some companies trying to do some things in that space and that's interesting, but that's not what we're doing. Our, our premise is that to solve this problem, you really need network security. You need to look at the IoT network, the wireless networks that support IoT devices, and use that to tell you when a new device shows up, if it's being attacked, if it's vulnerable, these sorts of things. Um, so to do that, you have to understand how IoT devices communicate on the network. And in the IoT domain, the network is wireless and RF. Um, so, and it's not just, when I say wireless, I don't just mean Wi-Fi. All these IoT devices, a lot of them have proprietary protocols associated with them. So the IoT vendor has spun their own protocol that's operating in, in maybe some obscure radio frequency band. And the only way to do that in a comprehensive way to, to see all this network traffic is to use software-defined radio. So that's what we've done. We've built this software-defined radio sensor array. It's basically a box that looks like a Wi-Fi access point. And our enterprise customers deploy them one every 3,000 square feet or so. So it looks like these, these Wi-Fi access points hanging up in the ceiling here. And those devices, our, our sensor arrays are scanning the RF spectrum from 60 megs to 6 gigs, looking at all the IoT emissions. Uh, we, we, uh, when we see an emission, we report it to our fusion center. And in the fusion center, we have machine learning algorithms that are classifying vulnerabilities and attacks and grouping devices by network and doing localization. Uh, that data is then sent to a user interface and APIs so our customers consume data about their IoT network environment and the network security of these IoT devices through those APIs. Sorry. Um, and, um, and so they can do, for instance, rule-based alerting and that will tell them if, if they see a new device that has a vulnerability. Um, uh, so one of the interesting things about our sensors, it's, it's software-defined. We scan 324 megahertz at a time uh, with a big FPGA. So we're not just looking at power in the spectrum. We're actually digitally demodulating these protocols. And because we've got a big FPGA, we're able to digitally demodulate dozens of protocols at a time and hundreds of channels at a time. So for Bluetooth, for instance, we don't just demod one Bluetooth channel. We demodulate all 79 channels simultaneously. Um, so that's what we did in Enterprise, and, and the, the IoT security call for SVIP sounded very much like what we were doing for Enterprise, and we were very excited to, to work with DHS to find DOD and DHS customers that might be interested in this technology. Okay, great. Thanks, Bob. Mike, tell, me about, uh, tell us about Tamer. Great. Thanks, Doug. So Tamer is a, 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 first of all, Mike Gormley, I lead the federal team for Tamer, and uh, Tamer is a software company that's used to automate uh, the, the integration and uh, connection of data that might be siloed across the enterprise. Um, yeah, the, the old adage of uh, garbage in yields garbage out. You know, so Tamer is a software that uh, solves that garbage in problem to improve uh, analytics and business intelligence for an organization. Um, the technology and the approach that Tamer has is a bit unique. It leverages machine learning to, um, to automate the data and to understand the data. Uh, we feel that it's a little better than a traditional rules-based approach to this. It handles uh, the variety and, um, and, and, and the volume of data on today's enterprises. Um, the, um, uh, the project that we went after with uh, SVIP was in support of GTAS, which is the Global Traveler Assessment Program. So this is an open source project that CBP has. And the intention of uh, GTAS is to counter foreign terrorist fighters. So it's screening passengers that are traveling internationally. Um, uh, there's also some other use cases for GTAS. It might be uh, public health screening if there's some type of outbreak. It could be small partner nations that have a tourism uh, marketing mission um, to see who's coming to their country, uh, who's coming in and out of their country. So that's the, the CBP program that we're supporting. The specific technology that they were looking for was an improvement to the entity resolution. So um, if, how, how do you take uh, information of known persons, mix in uh, reservation information, and also mix in uh, 
flight manifest. So who's traveling today? What was their reservation information? What do we already know about them? How do you take all that information and, uh, and, and uh, discern individual travelers? So if there's confusion between uh, multiple names or different spellings for names or a typo in, in how they entered the information, uh, simple rules-based approaches may not be the, the, the most accurate way to figure out who the individual travelers are. So Tamer's task within uh, the GTAS support call was to uh, use machine learning and fuzzy matching to uh, do better entity resolution of individuals traveling. So that, that's what we're doing. We're in a phase two um, of, that, of that program. Um, and uh, you know, when we first saw the Silicon Valley Innovation Program described, uh, for, there were a number of reasons why we leaned in very hard. First, it was a technical fit with what Tamer does. Uh, this notion of matching up all this uh, disparate traveler information was just perfect for the technology we have. Um, second was just the mission space. Um, as a small startup, using a lot of young, super bright, super talented people right out of school that aren't in DC, you know, they don't wake up in the morning and just want to work on government projects. You know, they, they, want, they might have other things in mind. So um, there's a little bit of a, you know, leading a federal team for a company that's not here. There's a, there's a little bit of um, work that I have to do to get people kind of enthused about doing the government work. Um, that might not be the most popular thing to say in this room, but it's, it's, it's a fact, you know. <laughs> so um, this mission of traveler security and public health screening, you know, it was very easy to get people that were not accustomed to doing government contracting on board to work on this project. So people got right behind it. Um, so, so that was a, a great thing about the SVIP program. Uh, the, contract, the contracting mechanism was fantastic. Um, if you've been in a startup and, and tried to bring that technology or business into the government before, um, you know, the, the hurdles are, are uh, massive and uh, merciless and, and long enduring hurdles. Um, we did a 15 minute pitch, uh, it was just a WebEx. I was, you know, in my basement office uh, pitching to a, a cross section of executives at DHS. Uh, I had an engineer uh, 400 miles away uh, joining me, 15 minutes, and it was, you know, start the clock, go 15 minutes, end the clock, and then some technical questions. That evening, 8 o'clock at night, got a phone call, hey, congratulations, you've been accepted for an award. Um, that's unheard of in, in my experience. Um, within 30 days, we were under contract. Uh, within two weeks after being under contract, we were at the border in San Diego meeting uh, patrol officers there, understanding the real problem set, not just what was in the, not just was in the, uh, the call. Um, we were at airports looking behind the scenes at the technology and the challenges they had. So um, it was really a, a, a true innovative program within the government. Uh, it's been great for us um, to meet people at, to, at, to meet people across CBP, across S and T, to meet executives, um, to get folks uh, onboarded and cleared within the department. Um, so uh, our, our uh, venture partners are thrilled with this program and the fact that we're participating in it. Great, thanks, Mike. Jeff, uh, let us know a little bit about what Echodyne's doing. Sure, so Echodyne's an early stage company in the Seattle, Washington area, and what we're doing is we've come up with an innovative uh, radar sensor based on uh, metamaterial technology. And I think probably everybody in this audience is kind of familiar with radar technology. It's got you know, a very long, distinguished history. It was first invented back in 1886, but it really didn't become into prominence until like World War II, and then it was a, cr a critical strategic technology in World War II helped, uh, you know, basically uh, Britain survive the Battle of Britain and kind of allocate RAF uh, resources more efficiently to go take on the, the German threat. After World War II, there continued to be a lot of investment in the technology, and there was a new threat, and that was uh, ballistic missile launches and uh, you know, ballistic missiles uh, you know, being launched for the United States, and like, how would we detect and track those? And so a new type of radar technology was created called phased array technology. And what that uh, enabled the country to do is have this uh, solid state design, this panel that could scan a wide field of view of the airspace and then track, you know, be able to detect a missile coming in and then track it. So no moving uh, parts, being able to scan very, very quickly a wide field of view and track many, many objects at the same time while continuing to scan that field of view. So what Equidine's done, I mean, if you look at phased array technology, you could say it's the gold standard of sensor technology. But where is it used? Primarily military applications on the nose, you know, of a fighter aircraft 
or for you know, ballistic missile uh, defense. Uh, it's not used in commercial applications. Well, why? Because it's, it's super expensive. So what Equidyne has done is reduced the C-SWAP of a phased array system, and what C-SWAP stands for is the cost, size, weight, and power. So this is you know, our first product, and it's a, it's a phased array, you know, radar using uh, metamaterial technology. It can scan a very wide field of view. It's electronically beam scanning, so there's no moving parts. It's a solid state, very reliable uh, design. And uh, it has moderate performance levels. So not the same level of performance, obviously, you're going to find on a fighter aircraft, but performance that is very well matched to commercial applications. So what are those commercial applications? Think self-driving cars. Think you know, autonomous UAVs are flying through the sky. How are those vehicles going to uh, navigate safely? Well, sensors like ours, we think, are key to be, being able to kind of enable those new commercial markets. But another you know, big application where the technology can be used is in security applications, and that's how we basically connected with DHS, and we have a project with the, the Border Patrol down in San Diego sector to uh, look at the technology both as traditional ground sensor, you know, so mounted on a pole and be able to surveil an area along the border, uh, as well as an airborne sensor. So fly it on a UAV, be able to deploy that UAV to an area where maybe a seismic sensor has gone off, and then be able to use, you know, be able to perform ground surveillance mission from that UAV. So kind of a quick, quick response uh, to potentially some type of, uh, of threat. So, you know, we've been engaged, uh, we're in phase two, finishing up phase two in the next uh, couple of months, and it's just uh, been a very uh, productive uh, relationship that we've had with uh, DHS on this program. Great, thanks. Hopefully you got a little bit of a flavor, dif different areas, different uh, technologies, um, but, it, but uh, all of them as essentially small companies. So uh, Josh, uh, walk me through the decision process from a startup company about trying to work with the government. Sure, it's interesting. We actually, you know, uh, so both my, my co-founder and I and our CTO further uh, came out of sort of defense backgrounds and we started the company and, and had sworn off uh, government business. We, we actually said, you know, from a small, you know, small startup standpoint, we uh, were not gonna sort of, you know, frankly waste our time and effort chasing uh, government contracts that might be 18 to 36 months in the future. Uh, so just from a sort of sales cycle standpoint, we had sworn off of government business. Uh, we actually became aware of this, uh, this opportunity sort of through personal network. And, uh, and just, you know, it sounded too good to be true in terms of sort of the speed of, of contracting and the, and the opportunity, but uh, we, we went for it. And, uh, and yeah, I can't say enough for sort of the, the two things that DHS is doing right here, which is uh, the speed and efficiency and sort of transparency of the contracting process. And then, uh, you know, sort of the common theme here is the access to operational uh, level uh, people. So, uh, I mean, we have two Border Patrol agents on speed dial essentially at our beck and call to, to test and, uh, and validate, you know, use case and technology. Great, thanks. Um, how about you guys, Jeff? What You've got a larger, larger area in the in the in the radar space. Why did you guys decide uh, let's let's try to work with the government on the DHS side? Well, uh, similar to Josh, I think we were skeptical uh, uh, because uh, we're a small company. I mean, we're, we're just hitting like 50, you know, full-time employees. So, uh, and even at the time, and we've been growing like 10% a quarter. So at the time that this first kind of came up before us, uh, you know, we were probably like 30, you know, maybe a little over 30 employees. And so even though radar is a great fit for DOD kind of government applications, uh, you know, the, the reason that our investors are, are giving us money is because of these large commercial markets. So, you know, initially it was kind of like, eh, you know, maybe we, kind of wanna, we don't want to kind of lose focus, you know, and, and pursue this. So I went to the workshop uh, that DH had, uh, DHS had uh, about, uh, about a year ago. Uh, it was an early, early summer of last year. And I was just impressed by how you know, collaborative it was, and basically they were kind of, they had a general idea of uh, some topics, you know, to, ba to basically uh, for, for proposals, but they were, it was a lot of give and take, you know, kind of listening to, okay, what the companies that were there, kind of their ideas, and so I thought, okay, well, this is, this is different. It was a much more collaborative process, and then similar, uh, you know, to uh, the, the other comments, uh, just really uh, surprised by how quick things move, you know, so, 
my CTO and I completed the application. It took us a couple of days to, to iterate on the application, and we, and we sent it in, and then uh, the process to go hit and pitch, you know, to be able to do the pitch was obviously 30 minutes. And in fact, when they first said that, I was like, okay, Really, I mean, I mean, I like streamlined. I like the elevator pitch, but I'm not sure we can get all the gold nuggets out, you know, in 15 minutes. But anyway, we did, and and so it was a very, very streamlined process, and uh, and so so all those things kind of built confidence that okay, this may be different, you know, in a, di a different way that the government is trying to procure, you know, technology from from startups, and uh, you know, now we, we're a year in, and I just say, uh, you know, and. I'm not like sucking up here. Nobody's told me to say this. It's been mo a model program. I mean, I would really like to see the government, uh, other agencies, take a look, a hard look at this because, from our perspective, it's been you know very collaborative, a streamlined you know procurement process. The contracting mechanism has been you know uh, very simple. And I have another project that we're involved with. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus on that, an, an, an agency in particular. But the, and we were going contracting through a prime in that case, and there's a lot of flow down of requirements you know, to us, and the burden is incredible. You know, it's kind of one of these things where I'm like, I'm looking for an exit, you know, on, on that particular project. So, th so I have a couple, you know, different projects to compare, and I'm just uh, super impressed with the, the way this program has been structured. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, uh, Bob, talk to us a little bit about um, the how this dovetails in with your commercial stuff and uh, and other investments people you know what what benefits have you experienced on that side of things sure um, I mean it's almost the same story as, as you know Josh and Michael and Jeff have said um, we we didn't plan to, to pursue the DoD space so my in my previous job I did a bunch of research contracting and research work in the government so I was familiar with that space uh, literally we've had 18 month contracting cycles so also extremely surprised and happy to see uh, contracts get completed in 30 days. And the, the other transaction authority is actually really nice as well because y you're not paying a lawyer $300,000 to go read all these FAR clauses that, that no one understands. And, um, and the, the IP is, uh, you know, we can negotiate the IP. We, weren't, we didn't just have to stick with whatever the FAR said. Um, so there's lots of goodness there. Um, and and uh, so as far as investment, so we've, we've raised $40 million now. And so Bastille, we're really, not only is it interesting commercially and, and from a business perspective, but we really believe in the mission. I mean, we want to, we want to make sure that, that the government has the best technology to protect themselves against you know, cybersecurity threats. So the idea of being able to leverage $40 million from, VC, from the, the VC world and have DHS, you know, we're in phase two, so $400,000-ish, that's a huge multiplier um, to be able to take you know, all that time and money we've spent building this, this really neat product and apply it to these use cases. And just one more quick one. So we've, we've also had huge engagement from the program managers, so Chase Garwood and CBP folks. We've also been to airports and seaports and border crossings and joint task force headquarters to understand actual user use cases. It's not one of these programs where, you know, uh, money gets tossed over a fence and, and we send a report in a year later and we get the money. Um, it's really been engaging, which is, is just fantastic. Super, thanks. Mike, um, it sounds all good. There's obviously uh, bumps in the road. What, uh, what bumps have you guys experienced in the process? And, and, and how would you tell the government to improve? Um, that's a dangerous question. Um, so the, um, the, the engagement has been uh, immediate and, and uh, very cooperative. Uh, in the meetings, I'd say there's uh, you kind of lose lines of who's, you know, what color people's badges are. But um, um, in our world, when we're doing this entity resolution, um, one area is it's always about finding uh, meaningful data, statistically meaningful data for any analytic. Um, and so we're doing entity resolution. Um, so how do we find hard data uh, to resolve, and uh, that's not uh, that's appropriate to be used. Um, our software's running in a DHS-sponsored uh, piece of, uh, of uh, I think it's the Eastern Region of AWS. Um, so, you know, what what can what data of persons can DHS give us to stick up there, um, so we can so we can just get rolling right away with the project? That's a challenge. Um, so the uh, the program uh, office provided um, various stages of synthetic data. The first ones didn't provide us much meaningful information at all. So we just grabbed some of our own data, the synthetic data that we had from a marketing project at a commercial company that was 
uh, random and, 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 uh, and allowed to be put there. And we were basically running with our own data for a while until the government caught up with, uh, with um, synthetic data on persons. That's, I guess that was probably the biggest challenge. But, uh, but no one was, uh, it was fully transparent. They said, hey, you know, whatever you guys can do, we appreciate it, we'll, we'll get there. And they gave us regular updates of how they were coming along and we give them feedback and they, they, they altered things according to the feedback. It was, so anyway. So was, you now have synthetic data that you're yep, using in order to be able to deliver. Yep, absolutely. So, there's another benefit you guys have seen as part of this, I think, as well. Um, talk to me a little bit about the clearance discussion. Yeah, so the project itself, you know, it's, a, it's an open source program. It's on GitHub. You can download it. You know, it's the government's work is sitting there. So we didn't need uh, clearance per se for, for this, for the SVIP project. But right away, we started getting, you know, after a meeting, uh, someone would say, hey, can you talk to us about this use case? Or we're struggling with this. So right away, we're getting pulled into these other conversations. And invariably, those require uh, CVP clearances. So um, tangential to this program, we have technical folks now that are cleared. And so we can have those meetings and, and do more, you know, more meaningful work kind of within the, the inner sanctum of, of CVP. Great. Hey, Josh, how about same same question for you? If, you know, what would you tell us to improve? How, would, uh, how, how can we better help you and help the customer? Yeah, one thing, and, and I don't know that this is so much a, a knock on, on CVP as much as just sort of a, the fact of life of working on sort of a brand new program that um, I think, and, and I think it's actually a good sort of open mindset that we went into this, you know, sort of expecting a, a standard uh, government workflow, right, where we have a, a set spec or a set requirement to start with and we build to that. Um, it, but it's been a very much an iterative process where you know we've worked together with the customer to to essentially build that spec um, as part of as part of you know the work package. So I think in that sense I, I don't know if that's even a if that's something I would change. I think that's very good and a, and a good mindset to be in you know in sort of the, the spirit of Silicon Valley, if you will, to to not go in with preconceived notions of of what the spec or what the end state needs to be. Um, and let the you know let the technical folks work with the end customer to build that spec sort of iteratively over the course of the program. Great, yeah, and I think uh, certainly the the CVP uh, mission space and the environment uh, down there um, requires uh, iteration and, and rapid uh, change. So, um, Bob, uh, one other question: um, What about the broader set of customers? So you you've got a fairly uh, strong commercial footprint. Has the SVIP activities brought in new customers that you didn't have before SVIP? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, we've got very specific DHS, like CBP people we're talking to, and, and Federal Protective Services. Um, so that's been great, and that's kind of what you'd expect. But I, I think by getting exposed to that space, you know, kind of as Michael was saying, you start getting pulled into all these conversations with um, DOD, IC, and other kinds of groups that, that are interested in this technology. And we, we wouldn't have, we're not even really marketing to that space, but, but just by being in DC in meetings like this, it's, it's extremely helpful. The other, the other element we found is by going into meetings, um, so our, our, the work we're doing for, for DHS under this program is looking at ways to take the enterprise product and apply it to critical infrastructure monitoring, right? And so, then you're talking to groups like power plants and water treatment plants and these are organizations that aren't really DHS, uh, but by having the, this program behind us, it gives us credibility to go into those, with those customers and, and have a conversation with them. Um, so that's, that's just been fantastic. And we, we do that similarly when we go talk to other you know, Gov customers. Great. Uh, Jeff, we haven't really talked a lot about this, but you've got uh, intellectual property sitting there on the table. Um, Tell us about the intellectual property discussions, what, uh, how that worked for you, and uh, why it's important. Well, I think it's, you just started the last part. I think it's, it's critically important for any, any company, but certainly a, a startup, you know, so the, you know, that's what you're, you're leveraging is the intellectual property that you've developed and convincing investors, hey, we're gonna be able to go and, and monetize that. And so, you know, any type of government program where you're getting some kind of, kind of compensation, you want to be careful that it doesn't get murky, you know, like who owns the, the, the intellectual property. And that's something, again, that, you know, kind of in our due diligence of, the, uh, of this particular uh, program, 
you know, I, I just thought that, that, that the way that was approached, you know, allowing us to maintain ownership of the of our IP that really was created before this project you know started. I think you know we had some COTS product and we're applying it to this particular application and you know, being able to do that, but also you know uh, maintain our IP rate a rights was really important to us and and you know, I, I think it would have been a kind of a if we if we didn't have that it would have been a showstopper. You know, and I think for, for most companies, you know, if you're going to get, uh, you know, 200K of the, you know, it's basically, you know, it's, it's 200K uh, through four phases, so a total of $800,000, I mean, that's not, uh, that's a lot of money, but, you know, compared to the 15 million of Series A money that we raised and invested to develop the COTS product, you, know, you can see that okay, we, we don't want we don't want our IP to be murky at all. You know, we, we developed that based on the investor uh, investor money that we raised, and I think that uh, so far uh, th that has not been a con uh, an issue with us with this program. Great. Anybody else have any thoughts on the IP question? Anyone else work with We had the exact same experience. We we decided you know. Um, investors want to make sure we own the IP, and uh, it was a very quick negotiation with the government contractor folks. So, yeah, same, same experience. Great. Uh, super. Uh, I've got a few more questions, but let me uh, open it up to the audience. Uh, the microphone's uh, left and right. Uh, if you have some questions you want to ask me or the companies. Uh, Dr. Mon, I have two questions, one for you on the program and then one for the panel. Question to yourself, you, you talk about a 10-page application and then a 30-minute, 15-minute presentation, 15 minutes questions and decision. What happens after that? Do they then have to do a formal proposal? I mean, what happens after you make the decision? So the 10-page application is the proposal. Uh, it has certain things that, that are required company information, financial information, technical, uh, how they're responding to the call, who the team is, uh, what their milestones are, because keep in mind this is a milestone-based effort. So the companies define the milestones that they can meet in the, four, in the first phase, but they also have, a, have to have a picture for what all four phases would look like. Um, then the, you know, after, the, after the pitch, uh, we notify them the, day, the same day, and then we turn it over to our contracting activities, and then it's contracting, uh, negotiating with the, the, um, the company. Um, again, using the OT goes pretty fast, um, but kind of at that point, once we have a signed contract, then it gets handed off. Every, every team on our side consists of uh, technical people from the science and technology organization and operational people from uh, the, the components or even the private sector. And so it's kind of a three-way partnership between the company, S&T, and the, and the end user. And, and that's been working quite well. And I would think that the rest of DHS is monitoring your success, and hopefully we'll see that maybe go across other agencies. I, because I see that Eric Joe from the Pill is here. He's either been involved or probably yep. taking notes, right? Yeah, Eric's been involved from, uh, from the beginning, and we've had a great partnership with OPPO. And, and the procurement side of things. Uh, couldn't do it without the other transaction authority. Uh, we've had numerous conversations on the Hill, trying to make sure that's clear. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the only way we're able to move as fast as we are is with the other transaction and, and with the contracting and, and legal team. Um, we couldn't do it any otherwise. Well, thank you. I had a second question for the panel. I, I think Bob may have mentioned briefly that they went out for and received 40 million uh, additional dollars of investment. So my, my question to the panel is, uh, did the DHS relationship help in your, let's say, going out and get further funding? I mean, was this relationship something that you could use to leverage, uh, let's say, going out to the VC or to the financial community? Um, yeah, I mean, for us, certainly, it, it, it's a whole new market, basically, a whole new set of use cases that we can pitch to the, to the investors. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm probably the earliest stage company here. We're 10 people, um, and we're sort of A-round financing right now. So uh, having the, you know, essentially the largest law enforcement agency in, in the U.S. as a reference customer, and, you know, we, we tend to throw that term out. But, uh, yeah, that's our reference customer. That's our validation. It's, uh, it's, it, it's irreplaceable. 
Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead, next. Hey, Doug. Trevor from the Procurement Innovation Lab. As these companies mature through their fourth phase in SVIP, have you had preliminary discussions with them about how either SVIP or the host components plan to buy the end product at the end of the day? So we have, I mean, we have been having, starting to have those conversations, right? So these are all four companies that are in phase two. So they're, you know, they're less than a year in. Uh, phase three is a pilot. Phase four is some initial deployment. Uh, but we have been having primarily with CBP, which is, okay, what's the, um, what does it look like in phase four when CBP wants to buy uh, a thousand radars, right? Um, how are they going to go about that acquisition? Um, so certainly uh, some of the conversations, as you know, from the Procurement Innovation Lab discussion uh, center around uh, other authorities associated with like the NDAA um, Section 880 um, and, and others. But we, we, we don't have that completely locked down, but we have to have that ability to um, leverage the investment the government has already made and, and not start over after phase four. Right? Because if we start over, then we just lost the startup company. We've lost the momentum in the technology. We've lost the momentum with the, uh, with the operational components. So not completely locked down, but still working on it uh, with you and with others. But it is, it is key to make sure we can, can do this beyond phase four. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. Thanks. Other questions you'd like to ask the startups? Do we have any startups in the room? Anybody? Okay, great. Yeah, please, Eric. So Eric's question was, has, do, do any of the panelists have experience working with other departments and agencies in similar style programs, and what's, how would you compare the experience? So uh, for Tamer, we've done work in the intelligence community. I would call it at the research level and at the prototype level, um, maybe not at the, the um, deployment level. Um, how, how would we compare? Like, for, so for us in, in SVIP, Get the um, the uh, GTAS program. It exists today. You know, people can download and use it today. So it's a it's a system that is there, and we're being brought it being brought in to improve it. Um, and it's not being used by the federal government, but the federal government is providing this to partner nations to use. So folks that might not have great um, traveler assessment programs can take advantage of GTAS, and they don't have to develop them themselves. They may not have the, the ability or the funding to do that. Um, so for us, it, it's our phase four will actually be um, likely operational um, right away. So I, I would say that's how it uh, would, would differ from uh, DOD or Intel programs that we've been involved with. Okay, anybody else? Well, we've got uh, some what I call more traditional uh, DOD you know, projects where typically we're uh, a sub to another company. And there is, I think, you know, one uh, IC project uh, through an organization called InQtel, which is a little bit, you know, similar. I mean, it's also kind of a lightweight uh, approach, whatever. Uh, but we're just kind of getting started, you know, uh, with that. So we'll have to see how that uh, progresses. Great. So let me uh, just close and uh, give you an opportunity to come and chat with these gentlemen. Um, hopefully, you got a little bit of a f uh, feel for what we're doing with the Silicon Valley Innovation Program. Uh, it's all out in public, all our uh, awards, their press releases. You can look the companies up. You can uh, reach out to us as well for, uh, for other uh, discussions. Uh, we have active calls. If, uh, if you're interested, take a look at those. And um, we will certainly be putting out uh, some more calls uh, focused with TSA and with uh, CBP. Also having discussions with some of the other components like the Coast Guard and Secret Service as we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, thanks again, and uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, in lieu of uh, uh, gifts for each of the presenters, we're going to make a donation to the FCA Relief Fund, Hurricane Relief Fund. And again, uh, if you'd like to make a donation, you can go to booth 307 and, and do that. Uh, one th last thing I wanted to mention, the panelists uh, 
will be around today, I think most of them, and are available. In fact, I think they'll probably be located over at the theater. If you go towards the back of the exhibit hall, there's a theater and there's some large, we'll call those cocktail tables, and these gentlemen will be around there and certainly can ask, answer any questions that you may have. So again, thank you all very much. We will be starting the next session here in a few minutes, so please stick around. So we are ready to start the next session. So uh, what I would like to do is I would like to introduce uh, John Krieger, the Director of MITRE's Homeland Security Systems Engineering Development Institute. And uh, he also chairs FCA's Homeland Security Committee to introduce our next speaker. So uh, good morning. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, just the program today, how we've uh, talked about the small business, uh, certainly the innovation uh, coming out of uh, the uh, innovation that Doug Maughan talked about of the requirements and technology. And now what we're going to talk about is some of those technology requirements uh, and uh, we're really pleased to have here with us to talk about S&T and the technology that we're uh, drawing upon to uh, meet the requirements of DHS. Andre, he uh, joined uh, S&T in uh, June of 2014. He's uh, assumed the role of Deputy Undersecretary uh, acting for Science and Technology for DHS. And uh, prior to joining uh, s and um, Andre, he worked for the uh, Department of Defense Intelligence uh, System Support Office, uh, where he was responsible for uh, finance, security, contracts, human resources, facilities, uh, information technology, uh, and so forth. So he has a wide history of uh, understanding uh, technology, understanding uh, mission needs, how to bring requirements and connect those requirements to the technology. So we're really pleased to have him here. Before Andre gives his remarks, uh, I wanted just to play a quick uh, intro, so to introduce you to s and about what s and is all about. And uh, with that, let's show the video. Technology is keeping our homeland and our hometown secure from the front lines to your front door. The Science and Technology Directorate is mobilizing innovation to secure our world. With our help, first responders have tools that bridge the gaps between each other and the digital age. Sensors allow incident commanders to pinpoint a firefighter's location inside a burning building. Search and rescue teams can use the power of data to bring missing persons home. Law enforcement can uphold our laws with added eyes and ears in the field. But it's not just responders we're helping. Our technological advancements are keeping the food supply safe with mobile applications and are informing emergency managers when and where to evacuate during a storm. Biometrics, video forensics, and the highly trained noses of canines are helping us screen passengers at the speed of life, letting you focus on getting to your final destination while we detect threats. Because we know you want to be safe and secure wherever you are. That's why we look at impacts to our electric grid and banking systems and keep pace and in touch with the Internet of Things. So whether it's the device in your hand, on your desk, or inside your car, wherever you are connected, you are also protected from vulnerabilities. We don't do this alone. Our network of industry partners 
small business owners, startups, stakeholders, and academic and research partners stand with us. At s and we work with you to find tomorrow's solutions today. Great day, Drew. Uh, so, Andre, would you like to sit down and stand up? Your choice. Stand. stand. Great. Awesome. Great. Uh, thank you, John. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here today, and I would like to thank FCA for organizing this event and, of course, for having me come out and speak to you guys. So given some additional context to the video that you just saw, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we are over at s and I'm going to then walk you through a few vignettes uh, on the projects that we're working on. And then at the end of, of my discussion with you, I'm going to solicit your participation on how we might better be able to collaborate to help address some of the, uh, the very critical homeland security challenges that we face today. Uh, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with s and uh, we are the research and engineering arm of DHS. And inside of DHS, there are 22 operational components, uh, things like the TSA, the Coast Guard, CBP, those other elements that um, you may or may not have heard about. And what we specifically try to do is strive to develop and implement technical solutions that address the most pressing homeland security uh, challenges. So be it with the uh, Customs and Border Protection, Coast Guard, FEMA, TSA, state and local first responders, uh, given the demand of the emerging threats, uh, we are increasingly focused on transitioning technologies that can enhance their capabilities. Uh, however, we can't do it alone. God knows that my budget is certainly not big enough to do it by myself, uh, which brings me to you guys and how we can better start to put together better public-private partnerships where by which we can take advantage of your investments, we can articulate what our actual use and needs are, and uh, perhaps we can establish a new emerging market uh, similar to the DHS, uh, um, I'm sorry, the DOD's D8, DOD industrial base. Um, so my talk today, how can we go about working together to build more capacity and enhance security and resilience in light of emerging 21st century threats? Um, first, I think it's important that we acknowledge and recognize that uh, digital technology is taking on new forms and shapes uh, at a very, very rapid pace. Um, which means that our historical legacy infrastructures are going to be challenged by new technical uh, capabilities that are emerging. Uh, things such as uh, autonomous vehicles, um, certainly our economic uh, infrastructure, banking, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, asymmetrical financing, all of these things that rely on underpinnings of Internet of Things technology are, are very much in the, the forefront of our investment of portfolios. And so we want to make sure that we are understanding how we might go about baking in uh, security into these new systems as they come online. Um, we are always investigating how smart technologies can help in the, uh, disaster proof in, uh, communities. And so we invest in technical solutions that's going to enhance resiliency across the different supply chains. Uh, so during emergencies, uh, you know, first responders are obviously going to be able to respond to those emerging threats, uh, and also those communities are going to remain um, open and, and accessible uh, for the residents that live inside of them. Uh, an example of this is our flood apex inside of our first responders group. So what we're doing is we're working with the Lower Colorado River Authority uh, to deploy small uh, sensors, IoT-based sensors, uh, that will allow state and local responders to understand where surge and flood potential reside and communicate that information out to its citizenry and the population such that a specific order could be given to either shelter in place, uh, where to pre-position assets, be it food, water, and so on, uh, essentially to take advantage of IoT-like capabilities to allow the decision maker to make those decisions at the speed of thought. I know most of us in this room are, are certainly thinking about Harvey and, and Irma, um, and, and so let me talk to you a little bit about what we're sort of doing in those areas. Uh, S&T, we're actively engaging with federal, state, and local emergency officials in both Texas and Florida uh, to provide modeling and simulation tools that will inform uh, storm surge detection capabilities, 
Uh, and that will allow them to make decisions about issuing, like I said, evacuation orders, the deployment of other resources to carry out effective uh, and potentially life-saving uh, services. So inside of that, let me give you a few additional examples of, of what I'm talking about. In Texas and Florida, we have a, a center of excellence called the Coastal Resilience Center of Excellence. And we're working closely with state and local operators and NOAA to provide advanced circulation storm surge modeling. Um, to enhance situational awareness and improve decision making on the front line. Another example is uh, a vignette where we're working with our Coast Guard and Rear Admiral Peter Brown from the Coast Guard is using uh, tools that we've uh, recently implemented with the, uh, the Coast Guard to allow them to, to also understand and make decisions about where to pre-position or, or protect aerial assets, so the aircraft fleet that the Coast Guard operate. And so what we're doing is giving those guys real-time pertinent information that will allow them to make those kinds of decisions. Additionally, we're using PBS, uh, public broadcast system, TV towers. Uh, it's a technology that we've transitioned uh, through the data casting uh, regime. And what that does is it's basically allowing for where there's outages in cell towers. Um, it's enabling voice communication and video communications. Uh, such that we can get continuity of service and understand where, you know, decisions need to be made. Oftentimes, those data feeds are coming in from helicopters, from drones, uh, traffic cameras, uh, all types of other devices that are non-obvious uh, in terms of their connection, but we're looking at novel ways to better be a, go about how do we connect those disparate data feeds and, and yield information that's actionable. Um, we're also providing technical assistance to the National Response Coordination Center in support of the use of HuraVac uh, Extended. And what this is, is it's a monitoring function uh, that is stood up to allow for the answering of many questions from users in the field and at FEMA headquarters, uh, as well as we're, we're also conducting stress tests on that uh, to see where it actually breaks, you know, how robust and resilient is it. Um, the HVX was transitioned to FEMA last month and it's uh, providing improved storm surge forecasting, um, and it's uh, using the National Weather Service's information uh, to provide these modeling. Um, also, uh, through our flood apex, we are using software to develop aerial and satellite photographs that map uh, high-risk structures in Florida and Texas, and, and this is allowing for better uh, response and recovery efforts and we've made these photos available to FEMA for ongoing um, you know, search and rescue efforts. So, so again, trying to use uh, our technical solutions to inform operational requirements and, and yield an order of magnitude improvement for those responders on the ground. We're also supporting a request through DHS's National Protection and Programs Directorate for assistance with social media analytics, right? And so what does that mean exactly? So a lot of times what you'll see when someone is stranded is they'll take to Twitter or they'll take to some type of social media um, forum to communicate whenever traditional phone and cell capabilities are down. So assuming that they can get the data out, what we're trying to ascertain is are there tools that can be used um, to provide automated real-time monitoring of social media data related to public health, communications, dams, electricity, um, oil, natural gas, the whole nine. Um, so we see the future where these networks are trusted and uh, the systems have redundancies and technical solutions that are easily deployable, uh, that can collect and analyze data in real time and provide accurate in information and recommendations to uh, decision makers. So how do we get there? Uh, essentially, what we're doing at the s and is we're trying to make an investment in both people uh, and technologies to bring new ideas to life and, and solve problems. So an example of that uh, comes from our first responders group, which I just alluded to. Uh, the Next Generation First Responder Program, what it seeks to do is it, it seeks to focus on future, um, on a future where we ensure that that first responder his technology can keep pace with the advances of technical developments. And by doing that, we want to ensure that they have the, the tools to be more protected and connected and fully aware of their changing environment. Uh, to be resilient, 
the cities, the cities are going to actually have to interact with the responders. And so we're looking at those hub and spoke designs through wearable slight technology, whereby which that actual responder can communicate with that city's infrastructure. Another very important piece of these subsystems is the cybersecurity regime. So whether it be for medical record sharing, the banking and finance industry, or just you know, increasingly you know, data among you know, pathogens and, and viruses and, and the biological sphere, we are always looking for solutions to detect, to be able to authenticate, to be able to automatically update, uh, and, and provide a trusted cyber future where protecting mobility and critical infrastructure while respecting privacy and promoting commerce uh, advances the public safety domain. So that being said, emergency decisions, they must be made, as you can tell from these recent hurricane events, uh, almost at the speed of thought. Um, be they chemical, biological, biosurveillance, or whatever the case is, uh, we need to be able to take predictive analytic type uh, technologies and deploy those to decision makers where the tools improve operations and decision support. Uh, where data assimilation and predictive analytics becomes something that's just natural uh, through the Internet of Things type of architecture. And this would give the ability to, to detect, to identify and classify uh, things that um, we're really concerned with right now, and that is bioagents, right? I'm hearing talk about, you know, Zika and, and other things that are going to be a byproduct of the, fl the floods down south. So how can we get ahead of that, knowing what we know from both historical information, um, computer-aided uh, you know, models, as well as autom you know, AI, artificial intelligence? So many of you in this room right now, uh, it's my understanding, are, are going through some reorganizations and some changes. Um, and what we would like to do at s and and specifically at DHS, is we'd like to increase our collaboration with you. Uh, such that we can together carry out the DHS mission. Um, threat trends, infrastructure vulnerability, um, intensified natural disasters, all of these things are, are things of mutual interest to both of us. And so I'm here today to sort of talk about uh, how some of our efforts uh, inform the DHS picture and then give you a better idea about where you might be able to plug in and assist. So public safety is simply too complex for us to do this by ourselves. Uh, innovation requires a certain level of, of collaboration and partnership, and um, I, we believe that those types of relationships can start here at AFSIA. And uh, as we get a shared understanding of how better to work together, hopefully those can materialize into to real work packages. We also are trying to be novel in how we reach out to the innovation community. And so we have a Silicon Valley innovation program that's ran by my actual cybersecurity director, Doug Mine. I think many of you may have been in his session earlier, where what we're trying to do is bring together the innovation maker movement community and offer them an entree into DHS by non-traditional financing models. The things that are not solely far based, those very long acquisitions where I put out an RFP and you respond and it goes into this black hole and then about 18 months later uh, we connect with you and we say, hey, are you ready? And oh, by the way, that technology may or may not be obsolete. What Doug and his team are doing, and he'll talk a little bit more about it later, is they're coming up with very novel business-like uh, uh, approaches where we would serve as sort of the angel investor or the venture capitalist, if you will, and the, the products that you offer, we would help you scope those around our unique uh, need statements to be able to, uh, to bring those to market. Hopefully the end result of that is an enhanced enterprise whereby which there is a DHS uh, industrial base that's very similar, if not emulative, of the DOD's industrial base. So our shared vision, I believe, is one where we have enhanced security, where we're thinking about how do we get ahead of technology? Uh, which, way, uh, you know, which way should we be going in terms of standards? If you're going to go off and, and, and make this incredible technology, what are those implications for things like autonomous vehicles, for things like smart electric grids, for things like um, you know, 
smart roads and sensors, do those autonomous vehicles have the potential to report back to decision makers in your departments of motor vehicles to give you road conditions, to give you other types of, of atmospheric information about your environment that would help us better provide services to the community? We think they do. Um, because what we want to make sure we do is make sure that we, we engineer these systems in such a way to where, I, I don't know that they'll ever be hack proof, but they're certainly going to have uh, security protocols built into them where they're at least tamper proof. And so that's what we're here today to, to sort of talk about. Um, I also want, if I could, to ask the audience to start thinking about how can we go about um, plugging in with how you do your business. Oftentimes we will take, and we're so singularly focused on acquiring our component needs, um, we, we seldom have the opportunity to really hear how you're thinking about IRAD and invest in your precious dollar such that it can open up other business verticals inside of your companies or your departments. And of course at DHS, we're always looking to partner with other government agencies and take advantage of that um, investment uh, such that we don't have to solely reinvent the wheel. So in order for us to make a difference, um, we must do some things that I believe is unique inside of, of my job description. One is to provide clarity uh, to you and, and to industry in terms of what our actual needs are. Uh, the other is to establish infrastructures that allow for enhanced public-private partnerships uh, and increased opportunity for the maker movement and the business community to, to play well with DHS. And, and then three, we must be able to uh, have folks like Doug in my cybersecurity division to be able to adopt the technologies that you actually uh, produce and integrate those into our business processes. Um, I'll ask these questions of you if I could. I encourage you to think differently about how we can work together, uh, to learn about our technical needs, and to please consider S&T before, um, and not my directorate, but the science and technology of the technologies that you're developing. Think about that before we actually make a design. Uh, and, and if we can, we'd like to, public, um, to, to establish a public-private partnership, either through a CRADA or some type of creative mechanism where we can share what we know about vulnerabilities and, and you can ultimately uh, deliver a better product for our first responder and component communities. Um, and lastly, I would ask that we have a lot more opportunity for collaboration. Venues like this that FC is presenting to us gives us a tremendous uh, opportunity. And if we don't take adva advantage of them, there's an opportunity cost, right? And so what you're going to um, be able to see a little bit later on, if you haven't already, is we have some booths set up. Uh, it's more opportunity to expose you to our problem sets, to how we do business, to the mechanisms through which we do business, and give you an opportunity to simply hear from us and our program managers so that we can help you inform, shape, and ultimately architect a much more safer Homeland Security environment. So with that being said, I think, John, I turn it over to you at this point, and you guys uh, ask me questions, I think. <laughs> Great. Uh, what we were going to do is uh, Andre uh, uh, asked for this to be a little bit more of a dynamic uh, speech and uh, asked me to come up with, as he was speaking, some uh, questions that I thought we would be interested in before opening it up to uh, the audience. So one of the things, Andre, you talked about was the idea of the ch rapid change of technology, um, how uh, that's impacting, uh, one, how we use it to protect ourselves, but also as an added threat also. With the speed of this change, uh, we certainly have the Silicon Valley uh, innovation program that seems to be part of that. Mm -hmm. What else is S&T thinking about, or how are they investing to keep up with that rapid change, both to use the technology for protection, and how do we do it, and just how do you invest to speed right. up? Right, right, good question. So um, due to austere budget environments, we can't invest in everything, right? And so inside of S&T, what we've tried to do is establish portfolios that are cross-cutting, that reach across as many components with a shared equity as possible. Not to mention the fact that the GAO uh, dinged us many times for um, buying similar technologies uh, across the various components. So what we try to do is we try to stand up apex programs and projects that touch many of our component um, equity use members as well as delivering technical solutions that are scalable 
across the entirety of our 22 operational components. And one thing that we are, are trying to do more is get out into the maker community, like places like Austin, Texas, and Boston, and Pittsburgh, and, um, and uh, Silicon Valley, and Research Triangle Park, so that we can better articulate what our needs are. But the most important part, I think, coming out of all of this is how we're trying to make investments that will ultimately link the virtual and internet of things world with the physical world. The quicker we can drive down that distance between uh, enhanced uh, machine learning, AI, and augmented re reality, and integrate that into real operationally relevant technologies for first responders, I think uh, would be the, the, the number one step in priority in terms of how I think about what should our portfolio be and how should we make strategic investments um, using those precious dollars. Thanks, Andre. Another question uh, that's a little off, but I think that all these technologies, and you gave great examples of how we deployed uh, uh, responding to Hurricane uh, Harvey and Irma and trying to bring technology to that. Um, one, could you talk a little bit about that and also about how you're working to overcome, I'll say, the valley of death of transition? Right. You know, whether, you know, partnering, uh, certainly with components and needs, but uh, have we made better progress in, in addressing that valley of uh, death? Uh, sure. I'll say that we're all familiar with. Yeah, two part. So the first part is a, a very, very Im important uh, question that we struggle with all the time, and that is, how do we select the blue skies R&D that industry is not really invested into and that is uniquely in the government's job jar to make those investments in, right? How do we s select that? And the way we do it is we, we try as best we can to understand both the immediate and future needs of the operational components. And so we try to compile that data right, about the things that they need today to solve a problem, and then those non-obvious things that may not be in the operational components crosshair. And so we have a robust tech scouting department inside of our research and development partnerships group that's looking at technologies that are emerging. Um, and so we try to, to scale our understanding of the immediate world with the velocity of technologies coming online, and then we try to merge that gap between what will industry not invest in and what should we, the government, invest in, such that whenever it's time for that operational component to need that technology, we've at least done the blue skies R&D that will accelerate an acquisition and not have a start from scratch. Um, the other part of the question was um, one of, of how do we actually deploy it? So quite frankly, I'll give you some inside baseball. Whenever a storm or something like that is coming online, either the deputy secretary, the secretary, or the component leaders will quite literally send out a data call uh, through the DHS enterprise. And what they are looking for is, is anyone inside of the DHS world working on anything that might be relevant to what's about to hit us. So be it you know a natural disaster, or be it something that just happened at our critical infrastructure. So what we do is we put these quick tiger teams together. We then try to put all of those technical solutions on the table and knowledge products. And where appropriate, we will quickly integrate those into the operational picture and, and, and then churn on that. Ultimately, there will be an after action report. The lessons learned from those act after action reports will uh, be given to people like Doug. And as Doug goes out and does his thing in Silicon Valley, he will update industry with what those needs are, and we will refine it and do a churn cycle. Not quite the traditional Agile Scrum, but that's how we do it. Great, thanks. Uh, a couple, just two more questions before I uh, open it up to the audience. Sure. One is, we, you've really been talking about the uh, first responder. Um, and I know there's the uh, next generation first responder mm -hmm. uh, uh, effort that's going on. I think people would be interested in that to just better understand where s and sees that future of the next, uh, next generation first responder. Right, so, so how we see the world from an, an NGFR perspective is we should be the facilitator, right? We are certainly not trying to compete with industry uh, or anything like that. We're trying to open up the aperture as wide as possible. So as we see things like your smart watches, 
your wearables technology, athletic apparel uh, companies are, are making things that now interact with the stuff that you wear so that you can go back and later look at how well you did uh, in terms of your workout. We're trying to say, if those kind of technologies are coming online, what's the relevance to our operational mission? How might a first responder, be he a firefighter, an EMS, a police officer, how might they be able to take advantage of that information? And as things like body cameras come online, things like the need for autonomous aerial vehicles that give better situational awareness or you know, terrain, um, how can we integrate that kind of technology across a federated system of IoT-like devices and do it at an affordable price with standards that are secure? So the first generation next responder is but an example of uh, a very real project that we're trying to bring ideas together um, from a technical standpoint and a realistic operational standpoint. What we need from the maker community is what is it that we're missing? How can the ideas that you have better enhance the operational picture that we may not be thinking about. And moreover, if you're on the verge of introducing some new technology in the wearables domain, how could you begin to partner with us early on so that we could think about how to integrate that into uh, the next generation first responder? I think quite simply, think of it in terms of one day does RoboCop actually exist, or Optimus Prime, or some, you know, Tony Stark and the, the Iron Man. We're trying to get to an end state where that is commonplace and be it you know, robotics to help in, enhance one's physical abilities or be it a prosthesis that would be specifically designed to address uh, some emergent threat. Uh, we're not trying to, to narrow the, the aperture, we're trying to really open that thing up and uh, we certainly need your help to do it. Great. Um, the other thing you talked about it was a little bit about uh, security and uh, how you're addressing security, whether it's in the first responder. What's, what's the direction of the cybersecurity division uh, yeah. under uh, your organization as far as where are they headed? Absolutely. Next? So um, so I'll talk about it from a, from a strategic standpoint. And, and then since I have Doug sitting here in the room, I'm going to ask Doug to come up and talk more specifically about the direction of the CSD. Uh, division. Um, so cybersecurity, right? It permeates everything. You recently heard about the, the designation of voting machines as critical infrastructure and, and how the cyber uh, uh, architecture of said machines is so important. Everything that our operational components do almost have a cyber connection to it. And so whether it's the sharing of information or the way that non uh, or, or disparate devices connect to central hubs. Our mission set is to ensure that the efficacy of those systems and the data traveling across it is as robust and secure as possible. Ultimately, what we need to do is not secure the data for the sake of securing the data. We need to really secure the data because the decisions that our leaders make stemming from those systems uh, means life and death and oftentimes, or it can mean significant financial um, impact adverse implications, how to go about issuing out, you know, FEMA-related uh, disaster relief. All of those decisions are connected in some way to an automated information world. Uh, so I try to, as the, um, as the Deputy Undersecretary, I try to interface with my component counterparts to make sure that their operational use cases is clearly understood by me and then ultimately uh, shape our investment portfolio around those use needs. Um, but Doug, in terms of some of the very specific things you're working on and how you're interfacing with the community, if I could get you to come up and, and maybe give a few words, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, boss. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with the DHS mission in cybersecurity, it's really fourfold. The, the first is critical infrastructure, as Andre talked about. DHS does have the mission to work with the private sector to secure critical infrastructure, and we have act, uh, a lot of activities there, uh, banking and finance, energy, oil and gas, automotive, manufacturing, et cetera. The second is our own government network. So DHS does have the responsibility for .gov. And so we're looking at uh, what, what does the future hold for us as far as the government networks, and how do we make them more secure and, uh, and improve our own posture? 
Third, of course, is DHS's mission as a law enforcement organization. So we are uh, responsible there for working with CBP, ICE, Secret Service, Coast Guard to try to bring new technologies. The criminals are all going online. And uh, how do they do their job differently uh, than they've done in the past? And then the last part, of course, is where we fit in from a science and technology perspective, which is developing new technologies and transitioning and commercializing those technologies. We also have other missions uh, in the education space. So if you think about cybersecurity in the next generation, uh, how do we bring in uh, the 18-year-old or the 19-year-old that, that we want to, to work in the government to uh, bring their smarts to, to help us defend our own systems and networks? Um, a couple of other things that I think are useful for this group to know about is um, you ask about what, what's next, right? So. Um, in addition to those mission spaces and, and things like critical infrastructure, uh, you may have seen an announcement just this past week where we're, we've just uh, funded five companies uh, and organizations to look at the mobile application security space. We published in May a, a pretty lengthy report directed by Congress where we uh, studied the threats to our mobile uh, infrastructure, the mobile devices, and um, so we've now funded some work uh, looking at mobile applications. Uh, we all use our devices. We all download applications. You have no idea where that application came from. You have no idea about the security of that application. And, but we're putting it on our government phone, and it could actually compromise our government infrastructure. So uh, we hope those solutions will help. And the last one I think is important for everybody to understand is we've just launched a, our own APEX program within cybersecurity looking at the finance sector. So the, the, the idea behind the APEX program is it's, a, it's also using an OTA approach with a consortium-based OT uh, that allows us to bring in commercial companies and commercial technologies to actually assist the finance sector. Uh, essentially, as Andre said, trying to be a tech scouting organization for the finance sector and bring them new technologies uh, to help them in, uh, ensure a secure finance infrastructure. So thanks. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Uh, it looks like we have a uh, question, so we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, I see General Shea ran back there to the uh, microphone, so uh, Bob? Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm the uh, President and CEO uh, of AFCEA. You know, as I, as I look at the world right now, this is probably one of the most challenging times, certainly in my lifetime, and I think it's important we're able to bring industry, government, and academia together. So I applaud what you're trying to do in your outreach. But what I'd like to know is what are the impediments, either artificial, man-made, or policy, which can be changed, that keep you from doing the things that you need to do to deliver the capabilities or identify the capabilities uh, that we need to get on with the, the business of securing the nation? Well, wow. so there are many. Um, but let me try to, to... And which one are policy, really, which is things yeah. that can be changed, or in some cases, they're artificial roadblocks that are put in the way Oftentimes. that keep you from doing your job. So if you were to talk to our operational components, uh, I think the biggest challenge that you hear them say uh, when you ask, you know, how's your relationship with s and it's uh, the, the acquisition of things, of technical widgets and gadgets and stuff. And so the way that we're structured at s and um, poses a fundamental challenge. We don't have acquisition authority uh, the way that, say, uh, at and or, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have that. It's not written into uh, what we are as s and um, And I understand the reasons behind it, but there is some adverse uh, causality associated with that. When Doug's team goes off and builds a prototype, Oftentimes, it's just that one prototype. And it hasn't been optimized. It not, it's not sleek and polished. Um, it may be in several pieces. And, but what we did is we made that investment to demonstrate that it could be achieved, whatever that mission requirement was. I think one of the things that would be very helpful would be is if we could get some type of low rate initial production authority, such that we could not only do that prototype, but perhaps also acquire, say, 100 units or something like that. That way we could get those units into the operational um, components' hands so that they could mess with it and, and tweak it and play with it and do some other things. But more importantly, here's the business uh, driver that I think poses the biggest challenge. 
By the time we deliver the prototype and then the operational component goes through the traditional acquisition cycle, there's a tremendous amount of time there. And, and oftentimes there may be a protest or it may just take a long time to get the RFP in and then there's a source selection, a whole bunch of other things that are occurring. Um, so the quicker that we as senior leaders can drive down that distance between a need, an R&D development, and a procurement, I think we quickly begin to close the gap on some of those um, both artificial and, uh, and, and very real challenges that are inherent inside of our uh, Authorization Act. So um, there are many others, but I think for the purposes of uh, trying to draw it all together with a, a vignette of relevance, uh, that would certainly help us out tremendously. Thank you, General. We have another question. Hi, my name is Celeste Strager, and I work for Symantec, a large cybersecurity company. And one of the things that I'm often frustrated with is I see these solicitations, BAAs, come out from S&T for requirements. And I often think, wow, we already do that. And um, how do you, so my question is, how would you suggest industry educate you on some of the things that are available today that you may or may not know about? Because one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned, when I, oh, I see these things, and then I'll make a phone call, it's often too late because you're funding new research. But sometimes I feel like that's a waste of money. Um, right. And so I'm working with the operational components, but maybe I'm not getting to everyone. Or right. maybe you know one of the components that was the lead for your requirements was not one that I got to. So any suggestions would be very helpful. I think there are a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to blame Doug uh, for your challenges. It's, it's all his fault. Um, there are a couple of, of mechanisms that I think um, companies like Symantec um, could certainly take advantage of. Um, oftentimes, the way that the BAAs are written, uh, because it's broad and it's not very prescriptive in terms of, I need this size and this weight and this power. I'm trying to encourage industry to come up with the solution. I'm just trying to give you a problem set. Uh, that the requirement oftentimes appears as though it's a, a pretty you know, simple one to, to address. But once you actually get inside of the operational requirement, you'll see that we're, we're actually in need of a, a uniquely tailored solution. And so how do, how do we bridge that gap? I think there are cooperative research and development agreements that we could enter into uh, that would allow you to better expose um, what it is that's your unique offering while protecting your, your IP, your secret sauce, and, and all of that, while at the same time we give you an entree into our operational world without disadvantaging the rest of industry. Um, I don't have a very specific answer um, other than to say the better we can collaborate and interface and the more I can have Doug come out and receive your duty briefs and understand the nuances behind your technical solution and in, con in contrast to that articulate this is exactly what NPPD means when it says it needs X, Y, or Z. I think we can certainly merge that. I, I think also that there's uh, perhaps a level of unfamiliarity with our law enforcement-like communities and specifically interfacing with the technical base. And, and I don't mean it as a pejorative, I only mean it to say that oftentimes our state and local and federal first responders have a, a history of buying technology, buying equipment that's already pre-baked, and so they, they simply use what they have. And what we're trying to do is trying to make sure that we create unique offerings inside of those technical solutions that are scalable, and oftentimes that gets articulated in the form of a BAA. So I'll commit that we'll do a, a better job of, of trying to understand what it is that's unique about what you have to offer, and in contrast to that, um, being able to better explain what we mean when we say we have a need. Other questions? Other questions? I think one last question, uh, Andre, would be, um, I think you've given a, a lot of indications of how you're asking for FCA and industry to engage. Is there a, a, bet, a way or a consistent way, certainly the Silicon uh, Valley Innovation Program is one great way that uh, industry can uh, get in touch. And what was special about that, what I listened to, 
was how uh, a, a user is actually assigned to that project and getting that feedback uh, in real time and so forth. So is there uh, different forums that you would suggest or different uh, sites uh, industry should be going to to get those requirements and figure out how they can better engage? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first thing I would, would try to do would be to draw your attention to our publicly facing website at s and um, Starting with the previous administration, we've taken uh, tremendous steps to try to make it more intuitive and user friendly. Um, things inside of that site are going to be announcements on when specific opportunities for engagement occur what exactly the nature of the technology is, what the delivery in-state objectives uh, behind that technology are, um, what are the measures of success behind any particular program that we're advancing. And, and oftentimes when you hear DHS, and because we are so many different agencies and components, it's so easy to get lost in that you know, big ocean of, of boiling you know, technical requirements with operational requirements, with policy and financial issues. So um, I would say if you could start with our s and website, number one. Secondly, if you have an opportunity to come to our industry days, um, what we try to do is bring in both operational uh, equities along with technical, uh, the technical community. And the, the more we can drive the two of you together, um, it actually helps me in a, in a very specific kind of way. If you articulate uh, to a, an end user that you have a solution that they need, then they're going to be able to be an advocate and sort of evangelize for that technical domain, which gives me the efficacy to say to Congress, oftentimes because I'm up there before them, uh, this is why I made this investment. I, I get a lot more uh, responsiveness from the Hill if I have someone in a, a brown, a blue, or a green suit standing beside me saying, yes, Andre is delivering me a service and uh, an industry is going to be a, a huge um, factor in driving that solution. Um, so if, if you take a, a methodical approach first, um, education through learning and these types of opportunities, me to come out and talk to you. Um, second, interfacing with people like Doug who have the unique mission to uh, allocate those pre precious resources towards technical solutions. And then third, um, the, the quicker you can um, understand what exactly a fire chief means when he says, this is my challenge, uh, I think that we can um, quickly uh, begin to do the things that AFSIA, uh, as well as the s and is looking to do, and that is create a, a public-private relationship uh, where it's win-win for everyone.